I, I told you, saw you, you were in the player, architect. Right. Player. What, 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 do, do you think you fit in that one? Uh, yeah, I think I think we have a very very creative laboratory, uh, and I like pushing the boundaries into what's what called disruptive or transformative technology. And we have, you know, artists in the lab, and uh, yeah, I think player would would fit. But also, I think the, the importance of the fun of playing with DNA with, yeah. with the science. Like, uh, in right. that sense, I mean it also. Right. Yeah, I mean. You, we don't take ourselves too seriously. We we try to uh, th do experiments that that are both uh, imp important for something societal, but they're also very playful and and illustrate uh, an interesting uh, way of looking at things. It's, it usually makes people smile and surprised. Yeah. And how come? Why is that? Do you think? Why do we do that? No, but, but why, why do why they smile? Do well, some of them are, are uh, funny, like making uh, 70 billion copies of my book. Uh, that's more than all the uh, most uh, well-purchased uh, books in history. And it's kind of a funny idea. And the idea that the DNA could last for 700,000 years or maybe a million years is, is fun. And uh, making a woolly mammoth is uh, for you know, you, you can have a serious reason like the, the uh, survival of the Asian elephant, or, but it's also very, it just makes you smile to think that a new, an old animal that's extinct comes back. That's, that's one, of the, one of the projects yes, that people right. are working on. Right? Yes, uh -huh. yeah. And in, in what way uh, is the personal genome project is, is, uh, is, is part of your, your, your work? What, what Right. Yeah. So in a way, that's that's very serious. Uh, in that, when we started it ten years ago, uh, there were all these really scary uh, and crazy rules uh, that didn't that didn't really make sense. Like that, that uh, that that your DNA would your 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 information, medical information, would never uh, eg escape from the lab, even though there were multiple examples like WikiLeaks and so forth. And then once it escaped, it would never be re-identified, even though it was a very rich data set, and we know we can re-identify. Uh, that if we learned something about you it would, it would, uh, that could save your life, we couldn't tell you because we couldn't give data back to you. Just all, all sorts of crazy things like this. Uh, and so we wanted to, again, to take, you know, be a little more playful and say, well, what if we did just the opposite? of all of those things. If they sound a little crazy, let's do the opposite. Maybe it'll be either playful or, or super sane. So, that, so the, it's, the, it's the only project in the world now for 10 years where, uh, where you can actually have free access to human biology, genomes, environments, and traits. It's kind of like Wikipedia for human beings. Uh, so it's revolutionary and, and playful. And can, can you explain what it, what it exactly is? It's a collection of uh, big data um, of each individual person. So it's not just, it's not big because there are a lot of people, it's big for each person. And it's the way we think that medicine will be practiced in the future. But we collect um, medical records, um, a whole variety of measurements that we do every year on DNA Day, uh, where the people come back every year and get an update. Uh, sometimes new, all sorts of new uh, tests. And then, then uh, genomic, the, the, the genomic sequence and a number of other omics, um, microbiomics and viral uh, sequences, the things that in your environment that can greatly influence your health. So, that, so we get this big collection and then we make it publicly available so that anybody in the world can help uh, analyze and, and interpret and understand your genome, everybody, you know, everybody's genome that's in the project. And what would that mean for for the future if if, if the database is, is is getting bigger and, and better? And yeah. So it's not intended to be a production project so much as an inspirational one where where we show people people said oh you can't do this is you know it just it's impossible, and we showed well it's actually not so hard to do it and so now it changes the conversation and so many of the things that we thought were crazy now people agree that maybe we should be sharing data back with the individual, getting them properly educated up front, um, um, 
admitting that we can't keep the data from getting out in any project in any, anywhere in the world. In fact, even, even medical records in a hospital, which have nothing to do with research, uh, are extremely valuable now. They're 20 times the, the value of your credit card on the black market. So uh, many of these things that we were talking about 10 years ago are now accepted. Uh, so that was, that, was, that, was, that was the main thing we were going for. But, but what, what will happen is once, once it's widely accepted, we may eventually have seven billion people's uh, genomes and medical records available. And then you can find all kinds of correlations and, and what causes diseases and cures. And then you can almost personalize the, 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 the medication and the solution and the, is that right? Yeah, not, not, the, not only personalized based on your DNA, but personalized based on your environment as well. And most importantly, I think, is prevention. So an awful lot of medicine is you wait until it's kind of too late, where you've, where you've already got DNA, uh, sorry, you've got damage to your body, or you've got cancer. And even if you try to catch cancer very, very early, it's really already too late because it's already start, it's got its mechanism rear, uh, revved up to, to make more mutations. Mm -hmm. And when you look at, um, uh, so, so basically, when you would explain what you are doing to to uh, to uh, somebody that doesn't know, could could, could you explain it? Mm -hmm. Sure. We our lab develops radical technologies for reading and writing DNA. The same way you would read and write a book, uh, we can do that with DNA, and we've brought the price down by about over a million fold. And the um, uh, and, and the consequence when you when you when you look back. The, the last 10 years and when you look further in the coming 10 years, what, what, what do you foresee in the, in the near future or in, in 10 years that, right. that, that how it yeah. will look like? Yeah. Well, we don't know if we can sustain this incredible exponential speed where it gets faster and faster every year, but uh, if we can, um, in, in, in 10 years it will be unrecognizable uh, in terms of the technologies we can do. Uh, we'll be able to... Uh, change agriculture, medicine, um, forensics, uh, you name it. Uh, even, even information handling that you normally think is the realm of electronics will be molecular. Even that, okay. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And in, in, in what sense, uh, uh, I understand CRISP, what, in, what, what, will, what, what, what is CRISP first? CRISPR. Yeah, yeah. CRISPR. Uh, so, yeah, CRISPR is a buzzword that uh, that uh, really is capturing the imagination, uh, but it represents a much broader set of uh, tools that we we've had for for a few years um, to engineer genomes. So, in addition to the the new ability to read genomes, CRISPR represents a way of editing genomes. It's not the only way, but it's 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 something that captures people's imagination, and uh, we helped uh, invent that and. Um, about three years ago now, and and many people have improved on it. About seventy people have uh, seventy labs have contributed to a open um, res a nonprofit resource called AdGene, and then redistributed them to thirty thousand laboratories. What is CRISPR? Oh, sorry. So you know, go so. Uh, CRISPR is uh, the latest in a series of ways of manipulating the genome where you the computer. The scientists and computer define 20 base pairs, A, C's, G's, and T's, in a particular order chosen to be specific for one place in your genome, in your DNA, and not anywhere else in your genome. So it's both positive and negative computer selection. And then it, it will cut, it will search through the genome randomly and find the right place and make a, a cut both strands of the DNA. And then that either that eliminates the gene that it just cut in or it uh, helps uh, repair to whatever you want. So that's precise gene editing is what people are so excited about, where you can change it into whatever you want. And, uh, and we were the, the first lab to do that in human stem cells, um, but it, but, and those can be turned into almost any cell, and it can be done in a whole variety of different organisms now. Almost every organism that's been tried, it works in. Yeah, and then because the, the, the that's, it's like, like like you use, uh, but like like a Microsoft Word in the text that you are able to. Right, right, yeah. right. So some people call editing just making a, a mess, uh, breaking, making a break. I think that's that's like 
that's like saying that uh, ripping a page out of your journal is editing, and it's it's not really. But but this allows you very precise editing. And that and that's the, the the possibilities that it gives is that you really can can prevent a lot. When you is, is that correct? Right. Right. So you can now engineer uh, agricultural species, wild species, and you can do preventative medicine. And that's now because what I understood, it's it's now really in, the, in this this year, it's really also really growing this this technique. It's right. Developing hard. Is that, is that right? Correct? So uh, you know, it, it's 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 a three-year-old technique, but um, it's been growing exponentially. N the number of people adopting it is is huge, and uh, and Every new person that adopts it helps also make it work better. Yeah. Yeah. And then the consequences are endless because you can prevent diseases, you can uh, create, uh, you, you can uh, also for people with, with diseases that are very seldom, you can help those people right. as well. Right. So uh, it's particularly valuable for uh, um, so called rare diseases that are individually rare, but collectively there's a large number of them. And so you might have maybe three to five percent of the population is affected by these, yeah. uh, even though each one only affects one in a hundred thousand together. There. And, and so if you have two parents that are carriers and they have no, uh, uh, they will have 25 percent of their children will be severely affected. Very deterministic. It's, you know, it's not really probabilistic. It's almost guaranteed. And that means that uh, um, the only real way that, 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 that protects the family, including, you know, the ch so the children and the family are, are healthy, is uh, abortion, which is not acceptable to many people in the world. Uh, and so gene editing gives the opportunity of changing the sperm so that you don't have to affect the embryos. You can do it without hurting or putting the embryos at any risk. So that's a new possibility that has, has, has yet to be demonstrated. That will also see uh, an incredible future when, you, when, when, you, when this is further on developing. Right. Because you can, you can do a lot with it. Right. Yeah. yeah. You can reduce disease without um, eliminating the gene variants. Yeah. But you can also make uh, uh, viruses or, or bacteria that are uh, with synthetic, say that they can't leave the lab. That they, when they right. left, that they, right. they right? Right. So we've made biocontainment uh, versions of uh, bacteria that are, that are stuck in the lab. They can't. They have uh, very low escape rates, um, and this is particularly important if you put things into the bacteria that would give them an advantage in the wild, like for example, virus resistant. That could be very productive in an industrial setting, but you don't want that to get out into the wild. So you have to have both the viral viral. Uh, antiviral strategy and the biocontainment uh, together. That was actually done without CRISPR. Uh, quite a bit of the genome editing and genome engineering we do in our lab does not involve CRISPR, and that's a perfect example of one which, where we've done probably the most radical and extensive engineering of four million base pairs um, without, without CRISPR. Mm -hmm. yeah. where, where comes this, this, uh, this energy that you have in, this, in your work? Where, where is it coming from? What's, what's the source? Uh, well, I think the, the, the source of our uh, industry and enthusiasm is, uh, is just knowing that uh, you can answer very basic scientific questions at the same time you push, you drive down the price of technology, make, democratizing it, making it available to many people. And then the product, uh, the, the applications of the technology can be even more societally impactful than the technology itself, such as um, you know, transplantation, solving the transplantation crisis, the malaria crisis, and aging crisis. Uh, these these are all things that are highly motivational, uh, where millions of people are dying every year. Your personal source, your personal energy, where did where it's coming from? It's My personal you? energy comes from the 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 threat uh, that uh, all these people are going to die every year, um, and the curiosity. Uh, playfulness of the science that so you can simultaneously play and do something very serious which is saving millions of people. Yeah. And when did it start? When you were young? Do you, do you still remember when you were? Yeah, I, I remember uh, when I was a boy in Florida uh, living 
on the water, uh, on the, in the mud. I, I would uh, play in the mud and I would pull the creatures out of the mud uh, and wonder how they worked. And I would look at my father's uh, medical bag. It was full of drugs and instruments. And I said, that was an inst so, so one was very natural and one was very artificial. And I was in awe of both of them. And then, and then I went to a, a World's Fair in New York City, uh, from all the way from Florida to New York City when I was 10 years old. And, I, and they had created a simulated future. It, they, had, they had gone really, really far out on making a pretend world where everything, you know, they had robots that looked just like a human being. And I said, and then I, from that day, I, I could not, I could never go back to the past. You know, even though they didn't have a real future, it was a fake future, I could not adjust anymore. Once I had seen the future, I, was, I had to work on it uh, to make it happen because it seemed very attractive. It's exactly what my daughter also said. Yeah. Last week when I was at the Scientific Museum in Amsterdam. Yeah. It's dangerous and very hopeful to create uh, a um, fictitious future uh, in such graphic terms where you can walk around in it, you can taste it, you can feel it, you can see it. Uh, you know, they had touch pads in 1965 where you could draw something and then it would print out the, the whatever you drew, not on paper, but in fabric. You could actually make a scarf of a butterfly that you would draw with a, with a pen. Uh, that's, that took like 40 years before there was anything even similar to that. Uh, that that the average person could use. Yeah. And when you would, would organize an, uh, an, 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 uh, an, how do you say it, an, uh, uh, a museum or a, a, a fair where you yeah. would, 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 would show the future of us in 40 yeah. years, right. now, what, 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 what would I see? Well, I mean, to some extent, you, it, it doesn't have to be entirely accurate. Be, oh, obviously, it can't be because you can't see the future. But it just needs to be inspiring, and, and to a 10-year-old, it's particularly easy to inspire. Uh, so you might see uh, space colonies, I think, with, with humans that are adapted to space. You know, right now our biology is particularly, I mean, it was not designed for space travel uh, in terms of radiation resistance and the bone loss that happens at low gravity. So those, there might be some of that. There might be, uh, you know, either conquering our microbiome, uh, completely eliminating it, or uh, getting to the point where, where we're resistant to everything. And so, so we didn't eliminate it, we just got better at, at vaccination or something like that. I mean, so that you can, you can now go back to doing surgery without uh, hygiene, you just don't even, don't even clean your hands, you know. And I think there, there are many things like this that would, be, that would seem like science fiction, but if you create it in a, in a realistic enough uh, um, fictional universe, uh, pe pe kids especially will, will dream about it and, and make it happen. And it, it, it was already coming information out that you didn't expect at your own uh, data? Well, I expect everything. <laughs> so I'm not, I mean, it's, yeah, it's, 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 uh, it's fun. Uh, you know, I, I wouldn't say there's anything gigantically on it. Well, my family was very concerned because my father uh, had died of senile dementia and they were worried that I would, had some risk factors. And so far, it looks like I have the opposite. I have no risk factors. So maybe that's surprising. Maybe it's, a, maybe it's false assurance. You now working in the lab of the future because that's, somehow this lab feels like you are on the frontiers of right. knowledge. Is, is, do, do I see that right? It certainly feels that way to me. I, every day, I, uh, somebody walks in and gives me something that shocks me, and it's not easy to shock me. I'm, uh, but it's very common uh, that they'll come up with something that that really uh, changes the way we uh, uh, approach biological research. So could you give us an example when, when, when well, kind of shocks? Well, for example, uh, getting nanopore sequencing, that was some, it's a way of, you can have a handheld device that is capable of uh, sequencing DNA. 
uh, uh, engineering mosquitoes so that they can spread really good genes through the environment that would uh, make them resistant to uh, malaria parasite. Every little breakthrough in each of those two projects um, is, is uh, remarkable. Yeah. yeah. And what, what do you think of the criticism that you also hear, of course, that, that, uh, that, that it's not secure and that you can create also uh, the, the other side with it? Uh, yeah. what, what, what do you think of that? How do, how do you see that? I'm one of the biggest critics uh, of it. I, I, I try to raise consciousness and make people concerned uh, because if, you, if you're not concerned, uh, things can be unintended consequences. If you are concerned, uh, it, lower, it, it helps you plan for alternatives. And, um, but uh, in particular, I, I suggested over the last uh, 11 years, that 12 years, that you sh that we should have a surveillance mechanism in place where anybody that participates in these powerful technologies uh, and all the uh, ordering that they do of supplies should be monitored uh, by the companies and ideally by the governments as well. Why? That, I mean, that's, you wouldn't want surveillance on your everyday activities, but if you're, if you're dealing with synthetic DNA, that's not everyday activity. And it, there's nobody forcing you to work on synthetic DNA, but if you choose to work on synthetic DNA, then you, then you need to be under surveillance uh, because um, we're in a time where we don't know what you, what, how powerful it is, and so it's better just to have everything um, under surveillance. And in particular, what I proposed was looking for people synthesizing things that are extremely hazardous, things like smallpox and polio and... Uh, anthrax toxin and things like that because yeah. there's no reason they, the only re they should only be ordering that if they have permission from the government to order it yeah. and a very good reason because that's all possible oh it's very easy yeah. yeah and so you not only have to monitor how they order it as DNA but you need to monitor the machines and the chemicals that they could use to do it themselves but if you monitor everything then it greatly reduces the probability they could do it themselves yeah. Yeah, but that's also the other side of CRISPR that you are able to, to on, a, on a not very simple way, but you can, you can do in a way you can do anything. Yeah, CRISPR it has a lot of uh, power, but it's probably not the most dangerous. I mean, I, I I'm I'm not trying to reassure people. I'm just saying if you're going to worry, worry about the right thing, which is worry about uh, ordinary pathogens uh, that you can find. You know, in every you know, all over the world, um, because those are much more powerful than anything you can do with CRISPR today. Um, CRISPR is uh, CRISPR, and uh, all of our amazing technology for reading and writing DNA is now um, you can use it for better surveillance. I mean, if it's a million times cheaper, you can have it a distributed network of, of surveillance. You can uh, make faster and better vaccines that are very responsive to emerging threats, whether they're natural or unnatural, and so forth. I think that, that, that the revolution in reading and writing DNA is much more easily used for uh, protection and prevention than it is for misuse. For misuse, you just go out and, and get somebody who's got some serious disease and, and weaponize them with, with uh, ordinary methods, not modern molecular biology. And um, so, in, in the way, it, by making it by, by, do, by making it cheap and then by making it possible for yeah. millions of people, you it's like the internet in a way. Is it correct? It's like uh, uh, you see that the the, uh, the data on the internet is like it, it exploded, and then it it, it doesn't mean. Well, the slight difference between this and the internet, I think, is we have the opportunity of having a higher security and safety. I mean, I think in the internet early days that. It wasn't a top priority, um, but I think, and you ended up with kind of a culture that includes hackers and, and computer viruses and uh, credit card th or just identity theft and stalking and and, and so forth. And uh, I think if you had that, the equivalent thing in biology would be much more serious. So if you have a computer virus that might cause billions of dollars of damage. But a real virus uh, could cause billions of dollars of damage and millions of lives. So I think we need to create a culture of surveillance and 
um, and good deeds and, you know. And that's, and that's happening now, what you're saying. Yes, it is. Uh -huh. yeah. But we need to keep, keep raising consciousness and keep that motivation going. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's good to stay critical also. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Mm. And um, when you look at the, um, the future of what, 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 what uh, Huxley once said that um, the universe is getting conscious by, it, by itself, yeah. it's getting conscious of itself, um, the past and future, yeah. via the humans. What, what, do you th what do you think of that idea? Well, well it's definitely the case that, uh, that one of the distinguishing features of human beings is our ability to think very deeply about the past and predict the future. Um, and thereby avoid future existential risk to ourselves, our family, and to, in fact, the entire uh, planet. So, in, in particular, asteroids and um, uh, supervolcanoes could, could destroy all of civilization or at least throw it back into dark ages uh, by eliminating um, the social fabric and cooperation. Uh, the, and that, that's, that's even if we do nothing wrong at all. That's if we just, uh, you know, we, we don't create some killer virus, we don't pollute our uh, atmosphere, we, we, do all, we don't create global warming. If we do everything right, it could, we could still die as a species. And so I think the, the antidote to that is to get us off the planet as a sort of a space genetics planetary species. And we, ha we have to start uh, spreading. Um, outside of the planet. Yeah, that's also one of your, uh, one of your goals, I understand, is that correct? Uh, yeah, I, I think uh, we have a, a consortium for space genetics here, uh, centered here at Harvard, but international, and, and one of the, is to raise consciousness about the needs, the, sp the, the special needs that you have uh, that have to do with genetics um, in getting off the planet. Yeah. What's for you the beauty of the human genome? The beauty of the human genome. Yeah. Uh, Can you explain it? it well, it's uh, it's uh, beautiful, awe-inspiring because it is, in a certain sense, very simple and very complicated. Uh, it, there's parts of it we don't understand. There are parts of it that are amazingly predictive, and we understand well enough. Uh, it's beautiful, and it's it's a simple set of four letters: G, A, T, and C. And so, in a way, you can you can once you get a little education, you can read you can read it just by looking at it. It couldn't didn't have to be that simple. Uh, everybody talks about how complicated it is, but really, once you have a little bit of training, it's amazing how much you can get out of the human and other genomes. Um, it's a beautiful um, structure. You know, it's uh, very uh, elegant in the two strands and the way it replicates by separating. There are many things about DNA that's beautiful, uh, and you can ma build machines out of it. Uh, you can, uh, print books. and you can print books. And the, but your you and your team somehow are astronauts because you say it's very simple. But you are working. You, you are getting into the universe of the, the right. genome and, and yeah. everything that comes with it. Right. As an astronaut traveling through it, yeah. you are discovering it right. and more and more and more right. and more. So we are. Uh, how, how, how it must be. How, how is that to, to, be, right. to be that far ahead? Right. Yes. Yeah, so when I say it's simple, I'm I'm doing it from an unusual standpoint. Uh, it's, it would be like an astronaut saying, "Oh, it's simple to walk on the moon." Well, maybe for you it is. Uh, um, and what happens is once you get a certain number of technologies working that nobody else in the world can use, not because we've kept it a secret. I mean, we've we've shared it openly. It's a uh, <clears throat> we're very interested in open access. It's just that. Nobody, even though it's open, they, they can't necessarily practice it that easily or they don't trust it or, uh, to be as easy as it looks. And so then we have the opportunity of using it for a couple of years and, and putting together another layer of, uh, of invention and another on top of that and recombining them in various ways to get hybrid inventions. And it just keeps, in this positive feedback loop, uh, keeps going. And, uh, it's a very funny. Uh, it's a very funny experience. It's like, um, you know, it's like diving off a cliff. <laughs> you get faster and faster as you hit the water. 
Yeah. Because you're not in the water yet. Uh, yeah, there may not be any water. <laughs> it may just be free fall, yeah. Yeah. And um, but the free fall with a few people with you in the free fall, because you're one of the few in a way still. Yeah, there, there's a, there's a, a, a large uh, research community, but within that is a smaller set that do technology and there's even smaller set that does radical basic enabling technology. So, so some of the technology developers might develop a particular drug for a particular disease, but then there's a, a tiny set that develop technology which uh, can uh, be applied to almost anything. So reading and writing DNA can be applied to any organism and it can be applied even to things that are not biological. Like, but, uh, and those tools can be applied to themselves, which is what creates this exponential of just gr growing faster and faster, is that the tools that you use to engineer DNA can be used to engineer the tools that you use to engineer DNA. It's very mm -hmm. cyclic. And, uh, and so that's, that's uh, playful. Yeah, and that exponentially growing um, means that, well, it, it goes very fast and what, what yeah, what will that bring us in a few years? Well, hopefully what it'll bring us is, is uh, higher safety uh, rather than less safety. And that requires that we you know, talk about it a lot and, and be very thoughtful about it and encourage the new generation to be focused on safety, security, and uh, modeling and um, extensive testing. Um, but, it, but other than that, I mean, it, it will bring us whatever we want, it's unlimited. Uh, the, it, it, the question is not so much what it will do, it's what are the few things that it won't do. You know, for example, even computers, which currently now are not biological, those could easily be biological in the future. The most amazing computer in the world uh, is, is the human mind. Um, and it, and if, that, if the human mind starts modifying itself, then it becomes even more amazing than uh, than uh, a human trying to make a computer that that does, can't yet think uh, the way a human can. So we can everything it can be created. It's like a parallel universe that we can that can, right. that can be made. That's in all it's, its yeah. It could be uh, it's it, it it yeah. It could it could be revolutionary in terms of the, how unrecognizable it is a few years from now. So that fair work that you would organize to uh, to to inspire ten year old kids that's it's quite a difficult one to to put right to, to, to put in fiction what what or to, to show what, what what it will bring us right yeah I mean it's much easier to illustrate the revolutions in mechanical and electrical engineering you know you can build a you know like in the days of Edison you can build a a crude prototype for a um, motion picture uh, camera and projector. Um, and that's very, you, you, you can touch it, you can feel it, you can understand how it works. Um, if you were to create a, a futuristic vision today, most of the mechanisms would be invisible. Uh, they'd be so small that you, there's no real way of observing them directly. Um, and even if you could observe them, it's hard to understand what they're doing because we're not used to thinking the way the molecule thinks. Like, a, you know, a molecule might CRISPR molecule in order to cut, it might uh, jump around to six billion different places randomly, keeping knocking on the same wrong door uh, until it finally finds the right place and then it will act. I mean, that's very different from how you would build a, a, a cuckoo clock, you know, where it does exactly what you want it to do, right? Yeah. So I think people are not used to thinking molecularly, but I try to encourage my lab to think like a molecule. Yeah. Molecule is, and, and how does molecules think? Well, they don't. They're they're very random. They they they, they and they're fast. Uh, and so you might try, uh, you know, 400 times a second to do something, and uh, only get it right about once in 20, um, like making proteins in the ribosome. Yeah. So yeah. The randomness is, is important. Random, but yeah. But also the randomness at the mol at the atomic molecular scale, but then all of the the evolved machinery of life 
that overcomes that randomness and makes it very non-random. So for example, when your chromosomes separate, when your daughter and your cells replicate, uh, it's almost perfect. It's not random. And so that you're, what you're doing is you're using the random noise of, of the energy of the cell to make nearly perfect decisions that should be random. Yeah. And going back to the idea that you, uh, that when, with the techniques that we have now and the, the possibilities that it gives, that you really can create all kind of, you, you, you can start the sperm and the egg. So yeah. there you can already change things or, or, or yeah. prepare for you. Well, you can change it even before the sperm and the egg get together. You can change it in the sperm itself. Um, yeah. yeah, but that can create like a human dot uh, uh, 2.0. You can create a new... Right. I mean, you can, uh, you can alter... Well, we were already altering adult humans with gene therapy, um, not just in ways that, that correct something that's wrong with... that, 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 that correct an inborn uh, inherited mutation. There are even some where we augment them as adults, for example, making them resistant to HIV. I mean, it still is medicine because they they might be at risk or already have uh, AIDS, but the way you do it is uh, is not by a, a chemical that kills the AIDS virus. It's via making it, it's like changing the human body so that it no longer has the receptor for the uh, HIV virus particles. Yeah. It's like, uh, it, yeah, it's like being not, no, gold is a wrong word, but that you are able to really, that we are now in the phase and that you, that you uh, were, that you were in, the, you, you are in the middle of this, of this, uh, this scientific yeah. revolution. Yep. That must be incredible. Wow. We, yeah. I mean, it's like. Right. Uh, it's not hard to stay motivated uh, when you have uh, a lot of people in the lab that are enjoying themselves and making revolutionary breakthroughs on a regular basis. Uh, very easy to get everybody motivated. Yeah. Yeah, because I'm also working on the front, really. And the right. So yeah. at the bleeding, cutting edge of, uh, of science and technology. Yeah. So um, could you explain me how you work? Could you, could you explain me your working day in your... Uh, not today, because that's was a very busy day. Right, yeah. How, how do you work? How, what's your... Well, this day wasn't that different from regular days. Uh, yeah, I, I usually get up around 4 o'clock in the morning uh, without an alarm on my own, uh, and I work until uh, my wife and I walk in together. We work on the same department, the same floor. Uh, it's just a short walk. And so, so from about four in the morning till about nine, I get to do, um, I get to think uh, and uh, work on without any interruptions. And then, then I, then my day is packed with uh, with talking science with my students and postdoctoral fellows, um, and looking at their experiments and designing and interpreting. And then. Uh, I, you know, I usually don't take a break for lunch or anything, and then at the end of the day, I walk back home with my wife, and uh, sometimes I get to um, visit with my uh, daughter and granddaughter who live next door, and, uh, and then that's, that's it. Yeah. And I understood that you, 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 you need sleep. Yes. Um, yeah. yeah. But that you dream your experiments yeah. Already, or you dream your experience, and uh, yeah. can, you, can you elaborate on that? Can well, I'm narcoleptic. I have some kind of genetic problem that uh, makes me fall asleep all the time uh, during the day, even though I get a totally normal night's sleep. Uh, with you know, it's dark, it's quiet. I'm I fall asleep quickly uh, at night, and I, I I don't wake up in the middle of the night. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, during the day, I fall asleep and. Uh, and what happens is I superimpose the dream state on the reality, and uh, I uh, can't always tell the difference. And I'll talk in my sleep, and uh, and uh, but it's uh, sometimes it's very uh, helpful. Uh, 
y usually it's a nuisance, but sometimes it helps me solve problems and makes me look at things differently. Uh, of course, you, you've, you've seen it already. So well, I'm not sure. I've, I've seen uh, alternative ways of looking at it. The dream state is very uh, unusual and, and uh, creative, and, and it allows you to get out of a rut of what, thinking about things the same way you've thought about them before. You almost always look at them differently uh, uh, in dreams. Do you write and then afterwards are you writing them? No, no, no. It's, it's just sometimes I'll, I'll have a difficult, sometimes if I have a really difficult problem, it will, my, I'll just shut down and then uh, when I uh, wake up I have the answer. It's not, I don't have to write it down. I, I, I now know the answer. Uh, in other cases it'll, it'll just, something strange will happen. I might write a few notes, but I'll just forget about it and then a month later I'll realize, oh yeah, that was actually something that was useful. And the, um, uh, when you look in the scientific field, what, what do you expect um, how your work of field will, will develop itself? Or your, your, your yeah. scientific world? Huh? Yeah, um, our scientific world, I mean, it doesn't really develop itself. It needs funding, it needs uh, an ed educated population to support it and to, and to uh, join as, as the next generation. So it's, it's very far from self-renewing, um, um, but uh, there is a component of it where we, ins where we might inspire some of the other things that we need. We might inspire people to fund us. We might inspire youth to join. Uh, but a lot of it is you know, it's a very unusual set of uh, motivations and skills uh, that not everybody has. Not everybody reacts to uh, a statement as, oh, I'm going to look that up. You know, most people, they, they say, oh, it's, I don't believe it, or I do believe it, or, I don't care, but they don't say, oh, I'm going to look it up, I'm going to research it, I'm going to prove or disprove it, you know. But that's almost, a, that's the natural response that we have. And, and, uh, and even if you look it up and you, and you see evidence for it in the, online or in the literature, you say, no, I, I still need to check it. I need to do a controlled double-blind study to make sure that it's really, uh, there wasn't any researcher bias, that sort of thing. So that scientists are a very unusual breed in that sense. It, it really, some of them don't even, you know, they don't need reminders that this is, this is how they, this is really, it's deep in their body and their soul as to how they, how they uh, think about the world with deep curiosity, playfulness, um, but this rigor of, uh, of inquiry. And is it, were you surprised that the, the techniques that in a way are easy, as you said, DNA, yeah. DNA yeah. Uh, research, right. understanding, that it, that it wasn't broadly picked up then, that, that everybody was using, because you, you, in a way it was, uh, it was accessible for everyone to use, other scientists, what, 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 what were you surprised by that? Well, most of the technologies are not usable until a technologist makes them usable. I mean, they, they may be derived from nature. I mean, they, in fact, they may be very sophisticated machines, you know. So, for example, uh, DNA polymerase, ribosome, CRISPR, these are all very, very, very complicated machines. It would be very hard to make from scratch, you know, from first principles on a drawing board and then manufacturing it. You can make, once you see them, you can make variations on them, but making the first one, Without a hint, it would be very hard. Uh, but then, but then the technologist is needed to change that from a natural form into something that's useful, and then to improve it and improve it until finally it's usable by non-technologists. Um, and the usual reason they don't pick it up is because the technologist either hasn't really made it work. I mean, it sort of kind of works, works well enough to publish, but not well enough for you to for someone else to use. Or it works, but it's not very well documented, not very user friendly. Uh, so you kind of like you could have a computer that works, but doesn't have any graphics, doesn't have any um, any real way of, of uh, that ordinary person could interface with it. So it's not totally surprising that when people don't pick up a technology. What's more surprising is when it takes when you don't even have to give it a nudge. So like CRISPR, you just basically publish a paper and, and put uh, some plasmids in, in adgene, and suddenly everybody 
gets it to work. That's the more that's the more unusual situation. Uh, you know, out of maybe a couple of dozen of technologies I've developed, maybe five of them are that easy for people to adopt. And why come that that, that CRISPR is that easy to to, to, to be adopted? Well, uh, you know, some things are uh, require a new instrument, and the new and new instruments require software, and so you've got all the engineering conventional mechanical, electrical, and software engineering that you need to get them. So that takes about five years from the concept to something that people can use. When you have something that's basically what you found in the wild, uh, then things that you find in, in nature tend to be highly evolved. It's as if an engineer made them, but whether they were evolved or however they got that way, they're, they're um, They've got a good user interface sometimes. They, they, they do what you expect them to do. And so and why was CRISPR then? So, so also this general public picked up? Uh, yeah, the general public, I mean, we know scientists picked it up because it's, it's easy to program, the G's, A's, T's, and C's. I think the just general public, they're a little strange. You know, it's like probably the name is a very cute name. Uh, which, which wasn't, nobody really intentionally made it a cute name recently anyway. Uh, part of it is because, uh, you know, there was uh, some odd patent uh, issues having to do with it that got some people's attention. Um, I think part of it is just there was like, uh, it's like, it's like there was a, uh, a pent up, it's kind of like an overdue slot machine or it's a, it's a tsunami that's coming in off the shore and just before it, you know, there's a whole bunch of technologies that just before they hit shore, uh, you know, you blame it on one of them, but it's really the whole collection. So I think it's a combination of those things, the, the name, the patents, the, and, and, and a, a lot of other things that came that have been building up for decades. And, and uh, CRISPR will revolutionize, or the, it is revolutionizing, the way we 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 we, uh, we can work with the with the D, with the DNA. Right. Well, I think yeah, I think it's it's the ability to read and write DNA, and it's some of it's editing and some of it's writing DNA from scratch. There's a whole collection of technologies that is suddenly uh, many factors of ten, maybe a million times easier to use, more accurate, and less expensive, and. CRISPR gets most of the credit, but it's, there's this whole other thing, sometimes called next generation sequencing. There are ways of synthesizing DNA on chips. These things, if, if you didn't have all these things, CRISPR would be much less interesting. Yeah. Now, with all these developments all coming together, yeah. all, um, I, I'm still not completely, uh, I, I don't, still don't completely understand what it means now, yeah. because it's, it's such a rev revolution, but I can't. Right. Can, can you explain what, what it means that this, that this is happening now and what it will mean for me and my, and, and my family, and my, my, my daughter? And yeah. Well, nobody really knows what it means in the same sense that pe if you asked uh, even the greatest visionary in computer science in the 1950s what the computer revolution meant, uh, he or she would you know, probably not guess right. They probably would not guess Facebook or... Uh, you know, maybe even not even Google uh, search engines or Google Maps. Um, you know, they might have said, oh, it will be used for calculating logarithms for uh, uh, rockets uh, so we can do warfare better or we can do accounting better uh, so we can, so that people, you don't have to have human calculators. So, I, you know, I think the same thing, uh, well, for what? society will do with this enhanced ability to read and write DNA is we will modify ourselves in our environment and the way we obtain food and uh, <clears throat> all the materials that we use, including very smart materials like computers, all these things um, will be altered beyond recognition um, in a fairly short period of time. Will I, will I live that time or is that, or is it well, are we 1950? Uh, well, I, I, I was alive in the 1950s. Uh, um, yeah, we might be a, in the equivalent time, but everything's moving faster now. And one of the things that's moving faster is our ability to reverse aging. 
So if we can reverse aging, then yes, you will definitely be around to see all sorts of things because uh, there's no there's no particular there's no law of physics that we know of that requires aging. Um, we know that there are there's a continuity of life that goes back three billion years. So there's no particular reason why um, uh, humans or animals in general have to have to senesce and get old and, and break um, because there's cotton, some of the cells in the body keep on living in the, in the next generation. That's also where, you, you, where your lab is also active. Uh, yes, yeah. right. We have, very act, we have very active projects, plural, on, uh, on aging reversal, not so much on longevity where you don't want to prolong the end of life, which is unpleasant and expensive and where you become you know, less productive member of society, less engaged, you want to, what you want to do is reverse it back to a time where you were at your optimum uh, performance. You know, a young person like 65 years old. <laughs> but, and how is, is that, and do, do you think that's possible? Are, are you like well, it's, it's, been, it's not only possible, it's been done in animals. Uh, now those animals may or may not be good models for human, but it's it certainly is, the time is ripe for testing things that either cause longevity in animals or aging reversal in animals, and then test to see if they can cause aging reversal in, in uh, larger animals and humans. How can you do that aging? Uh, well, there are, many, there are many things that have been shown to increase the animal lifespan by a factor of two to a factor of ten. Um, there are things that involve, uh, I mean, not to get too technical, but the mitochondria, the, the tips of chromosomes, the telomeres, uh, the, the uh, gr uh, growth factors, and uh, muscle-related proteins like uh, myostatin pathway. So there's all these pathways that are pretty well understood. And if you harness uh, a little of each for gene therapy, then you can try them separately in combinations. Gene therapy is particularly easy to go from an idea to a test of it, uh, you don't have to take a side route where you uh, randomly screen through millions of, of uh, pharmaceutical compounds. You were talking about reverse aging, huh? the right. fact that you were able to, um, how, far, how far are we in that? Do you have, do you have gene therapy for it? Well, we have lots of demonstrations in animals, both of longevity, extreme extension of longevity and reversal in some cases. Um, many different ways of doing that. And so we're collecting all of those that are known for small animals and we're applying them to large animals and to humans. Um, the gene, you know, coming up to gene therapy trials is much easier, but we're still just beginning uh, yeah. on that. It's, it's looking very promising, but it's too early to say. Yeah. And something that might even work for large animals may still not work for humans. Yeah. What kind of, uh, uh, what, what is in, uh, uh, a line of work you are now in, which you really think, or, or in, in research project, you are, or your project where you're working in, where you really feel like this. I hope this 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 will develop as soon as possible. Well, uh, yeah. I mean, top priority, I guess, would be transplantation of organs, uh, malaria for developing countries, and aging reversal for industrialized nations. Um, and pre preventative medicine in general um, as a strategy. And then right behind all of those, once those are all working, we Im you know, improve our basic human uh, condition, then uh, space genetics. Yeah, one, one second. Brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> Allowed to close the door? Can we do that one? Sure, okay. yeah. Uh, so when you look on the project, where, where are you? Probably? Yeah, so the projects that, that I find most compelling and exciting um, in terms of applications are uh, transplantation of organs. There's a, a gigantic uh, need for that. Uh, um, gene drives to eliminate malaria and then uh, for developing nations and then aging reversal for industrialized nations where most of the morbidity and mortality is due to uh, uh, diseases of aging. You want to get at the core of that. And then once you have all of those things, which are 
drains on our economy. If you can solve all those, then you can reduce, you have more money available for things like uh, space, where we really need to get off the planet to avoid supervolcanoes and asteroids. And that has a genetic component as well. In what way? What's the genetic component? Well, we have uh, uh, radiation sensitivity and uh, our bones rot uh, at low gravity. And so even not only in, in, in traveling, let's say, to Mars, uh, but even once you arrive there, its gravity is 38% is, uh, of Earth's. And so our body was designed for normal gravity. And as soon as you stop, as soon as you don't have normal gravity, you have muscle and bone wasting. It, because the body thinks it's doing a, a feedback loop, a physiological feedback loop to keep everything right, but it, it's just, you need to have muscles and bones even in low gravity because you need, you know, when you, when you touch something with weak bones, you'll, you'll crush your, your bones and, uh, and you need muscles to move things around. So anyway, um, those are some of the things that are problematic and, and also there's questions like what do we bring with us? Do we bring all the species of the earth uh, or do we leave out the giant sequoia and the bowhead whale and smallpox? Do we, <clears throat> you know. We can create that again on Mars because we have. We could, you know, but you know, it's, 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 a, it's a, we haven't done that yet. We have not really re recreated uh, and, and so it's a big decision as whether you take it with you. In fact, some of them, it could be that their, their ecosystem is fragile enough that you can't really make it with our current knowledge. So having the complete DNA sequence of everything on the planet may not be enough to recreate some of the more complex ecosystems. Yeah, but when you, you create a tool set with yes, your colleagues to... Yes, that's correct. Yeah, yeah. to do that. Yes, we're big on, on novel tool sets, yeah. I saw this mammoth in the mammoth post in your, in your lab. What, yeah. What's, what's the, the story? Yeah, what's the story of this mammoth? So uh, a, a, a nine-year-old girl sent us two copies of that poster, and we put it on the wall. It's, uh, but it's based on our, she, she had read about our project uh, in the news. Uh, it's a small project, and it, it mainly benefits from the technology we've developed for other projects, like human uh, medical research. but it, these things we bring the price down a million fold and then you can use it for reading and writing DNA from ancient samples and, uh, and the idea uh, with the mammoth is that the Asian elephant is the cl closest relative to the mammoth and it's so close in fact they're both closer to each other than they are to the African elephant and the Asian elephant can breed and make offspring children with the African elephant so probably uh, the Asian elephant and the mammoth are basically very close to being interfertile. And so uh, one way of, of, of focusing on modern day species is to extend the range of the Asian elephant. It, it will already play in the snow, but you could extend it all the way out to minus 40 degrees um, in the tundra of Canada, Russia, and Alaska. And furthermore, so you get a benefit to the elephant, but you also get a benefit to the tundra because the tundra is melting, and this could, and there's experiments, in field studies that indicate that that a mammoth-like creature could uh, keep the temperature colder by up to 20 degrees uh, in temperature. So the experiments were the the the, the idea followed up by experiments is that. Uh, Trees uh, absorb about twice as much light, and so that, that, that's a warming effect. And the, the grasses uh, have roots that, that protect er from erosion. And then punching down the snow, the big, you have a big, fluffy, insulating layer of snow in the wintertime. If you punch that down, now you can get penetration of the cold winter air. Um, and these three things put the, the mammoths, or the, sorry, the Elephants or mammoths will knock down trees and replace them with grass and a much richer ecosystem full of some small animals. Um, anyway, they did the experiment replacing mammoths with a combination of caribou, which is one of the biggest mammals, and uh, tanks, Soviet tanks, that would knock down the trees because caribou can't knock down trees, but elephants can knock. Anyway, it was about 15 to 20 degrees okay. was the uh, difference between the the experimental and the control site. Yeah. What's the 
the, the var variety of projects that we are talking about here. Yes, right. Working. Yes, yeah. Well, we haven't scratched the surface yet. Yeah. Can you uh, <laughs> keep going? Let's <laughs> no, no, keep going. Yeah. Any, are, are there any particular things you would like to share with the? I think we covered uh, a good sampling of it. Uh, we covered the personal genome project, uh, yeah. data incorporation into DNA. Future. Future. Yeah, I think we covered it. Yeah. yeah.